Hello everyone, this is Cobain the Christian. Today we're going to do a video on the biblical theology of the liturgy. In the divine liturgy, the purpose of God for creation in Christ and through the human family is summed up, enacted, and revealed. It is the climactic act of God's good dispensation to and through mankind. And the Bible, as the written word of God, as the book of the church, as that book in which all divine questions are answered, as St. Justin Popovich puts it, either implicitly or explicitly, the Bible, in fact, has a great deal to say about liturgy. In fact, I think you will be surprised to see just how much it has to say about the divine liturgy, even in our um, summary view today. I'm going to try my very hardest to make this only one video, so by God's will, <laughs> that will actually take place. Uh, before getting into the substance of the video, uh, if you're a regular viewer, if you enjoy this content, and if you uh, want to support uh, this channel, uh, please consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member. You can also make a one-time contribution uh, during the premiere of the video or during the live stream. The live streams are every Wednesday around, they begin around 9 to 10 p.m. And I take questions during those live streams. You will get a uh, guaranteed answer as long as I have an answer if you make a contribution during those live streams. So whatever works best for you. But thank you everyone who comes and views. It really is so, so incredible encouraging um yeah uh so let's begin with a word of prayer and then we will get into the meat of the discussion now, illumine our hearts O master who lovest mankind with the pure light of thy divine knowledge open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings and plant also in us the fear of thy blessed commandments the trampling down our carnal desires we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee for thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee do we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all holy good and life creating spirit, but now and ever to the ages of ages. Amen. Uh, just a word, by the way, on uh, the videos. I got an interesting message on Tumblr uh, uh, <laughs> saying that uh, I had been talking very fast in my videos and that this gentleman was uh, uh, praying for my, my mental health. Now, I. I, I hold nothing against the, uh, the gentleman, indeed. I thank him for his uh, prayers. Uh, but a word of encouragement uh, <laughs> I, that I think at least I'm in good mental health. I've always been a very, very fast talker. Uh, one of the good things about YouTube is it allows you to either slow down or speed up the videos as uh, it suits you. Um, so I often find myself speeding up videos to uh, double speed. It just seems to be one of those things that God stamps on different persons. I have a kind of very quick rhythm of existence. I expect things to happen quickly, both on like a large historical scale, on a personal scale, but I also talk very quickly. I think very quickly, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both a quick and a not so quick manner of thinking and speaking. Uh, so I do apologize if you find that difficult, but honestly, for me, the form of presentation is inseparable from the content. The rhythm in which I get into this kind of stuff allows me to actually say things that I think at least are worth saying. Uh, so uh, I genuinely do thank the gentleman for his prayers. And for all I know, it was his prayers that were the difference between me having a psychotic break and uh, uh, and making another lovely video. So uh, thank you and all of your prayers for my mental health indeed are, are very appreciated. Um, okay, so... Here I have a list of passages. I haven't obviously given you the entirety of Leviticus 1 to 3 because that would be uh, rather too much text for one page. But um, it's, we've got these passages from Genesis, then we've got Leviticus, and then I have a summary of the divine liturgy. Now, let me start at the bottom here just by summarizing the liturgy breaking it up into three manageable pieces because this structure is going to be very important for interpreting what's going on in the liturgy. The first major act 
which I have noted here, is called the Little Entrance. For those who go to an Orthodox church, you should be able to recognize this because it's when the priest comes out with the Gospel book in his hand and he moves around and then enters back into the altar that is behind the iconostas. That's the wall with all the icons which separates the place where the priest stands and the place where everyone else stands. Now some people have reasonably asked the question, well isn't it the case that the wall of separation between God and man um, has been removed? And I would say that's a very good question and it's not so much that the separation has been removed, but that there is now a door so that we can process in and out of it. Heaven and earth are not just assimilated into each other, but they are tied together in communion with each other. And there's a great deal of symbolic significance, especially on certain major feast days, behind the opening and closing of the doors in the eye, uh, of the iconostas. Uh, but this first act in the liturgy where the priest enters back into the altar, back behind the iconostas, and stands before the altar again with the gospel book. In uh, the early uh, earliest days of the church, this is actually when the priest would first enter in to the, uh, 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 to the place right behind or in front of the altar. So this was when he first made his approach, and that's going to be important as we continue our discussion. Uh, I am not here suggesting a kind of liturgical primitivism. I believe that the entire liturgical tradition and its whole development is inspired by God. The church preserves those things in the liturgical tradition that the Holy Spirit wishes her to preserve. That doesn't mean that everything your local parish or my local parish does is inspired by God, but I do think those changes that get assimilated into the common and normative practice of the church uh, can be taken uh, with a great degree of confidence, but I don't want to spin off into that side issue. Um, the second major moment in the liturgy, which I've presented here, is the great entrance. So this is what happens after the reading of the gospel, the reading of the epistle, and the sermon. Uh, you will know it when the priest comes out with a procession behind him. He circles around the extent of the room, and then he walks back up to the altar and places the bread and wine on top of the altar. But before he does so, during the procession, he prays systematically for various people and prays at uh, right before he enters into the uh, altar praise for those who are listed on the diptych. So remembering, and he reads a bunch of names, and then he remembers a bunch of names of the um, repose, those who have died in the Lord. Now, while he's processing towards the altar, he prays for people who are traveling. He prays for the president the United States, all civil authorities, so on and so forth. And I believe that this is what Paul is referring to in 1 Timothy chapter 2 when he commands Timothy to make intercession for kings and all those who are in authority. This is one of the sacred roles that the church possesses from God. And you must remember that Paul is writing to St. Timothy as a bishop. That's why he encourages him to continue the public reading of scripture. That's why he talks about the qualifications for the Christian ministry. The things that Paul is speaking about here are acts that Timothy undertakes specifically in his office as a bishop of the church and the making of intercession for kings and all those who are in authority or in the United States, the president of the United States and all civil authorities. Uh, that is part of the church's work in upholding the world in its existence. If you want to think of creation as a body, then those who are in authority, both ecclesiastical and political, are something like the skeleton of that body. 
We've spoken before about how the entire cosmos, in a way, exists inside the mind of man. God makes the world through his logos, and God makes man as an imprint, an image of the logos, to be incorporated into the life of the only begotten Son, the logos, the second person of the Trinity. And because of this, creation's existence hinges on man's relationship with God. When man goes astray, so also does the creation fall into corruption. When almost the entire human family is rebelling against God, creation collapses in on itself in the flood. Creation only continues to exist because Noah and those animals who are with him are preserved on an ark, which is a sacred, consecrated environment. And after the flood, Noah offers a ritual sacrifice by which peace is reestablished between God and creation, and its existence is perpetuated by God, but in and through man, whom God remembers. God keeps man in his mind. It was God who remembered Noah, and the spirit again blew over the surface of the waters. It was God who remembers his covenant when he sees his bow in the clouds. This notion of memory and preservation of existence is essential for understanding what is going on in the divine liturgy. Because we recognize that as participants in that organism, which is called the body of Christ, we have through the spirit the mind of Christ. And if it is indeed the case that God not only created, but also sustains and upholds the world in existence in the Son and through the spirit, then it must, also, it must be the case that the church has an instrumental role in sharing in that work of upholding the creation in existence. Now, I want to make absolutely clear that we are not saying that without the church, God wouldn't be able to uphold the world. We are instead saying that God is something like a father who gives his four-year-old son five dollars so that his son might buy his dad a Christmas present. Now, if if that happens, the father is going to be genuinely pleased. He is genuinely going to consider it a gift, but it is not as if the father's net worth has been increased. That's an analogy that C.S. Lewis very helpfully uses. So the cosmos is upheld in existence by God in man, and especially in the incarnation, these two aspects of its ongoing life are united together. And just as this perpetuation of its created existence is, uh, is noted in the concept of memory in the flood at a sacrificial table, so also in the divine liturgy is this to be understood in a sacrificial context and in the language of memory. Think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? And in that very context, he speaks about the, body, the Eucharist as the communion in the body and blood of Christ. Now, as the priest is processing forward, what is the word? What is the phrase that he uses again? Remembering those in his kingdom remembering kings and all those who are in authority so that even if the civil authorities are not themselves members of Christ, they participate by extension in those graces which God gives to the church through Christ. The whole world exists inside the church, whether formally as internal members or by extension, when the church reaches out its arms to embrace the world and bring it under its care. One of the questions that I had for some time is, we often see God judging those who persecute God's people throughout history, not just in scripture, but also throughout the rest of history. Why is it that the emperor who launched the worst persecution of Christians to that point in history, Diocletian, why did he die peacefully? And I realized the answer one day when I was reading um, a history of that period. It's that Diocletian ended the persecution and asked the church to pray for him. And it was by the prayers of the church that Diocletian was not violently or um, by 
a great dramatic show of force. Shouldn't use the word violence. Violence is never a word used of God in Scripture. It was not. Uh, he was not judged in this kind of dramatic way that, for example, uh, Herod in the Book of Acts is judged. So a thing is signified by its name. That name not only represents the reality it signifies, but represents the reality it signifies. The reality is attached to the name which symbolizes it. And so we commemorate. You can see the word memory inside of that. Jesus says the Eucharist is the offering of remembrance. It is as his memorial. We commemorate specific named persons, both alive in the body and reposed in the Lord. And we do so as we bring the bread and wine, which will be consecrated up to the altar. You might think of everyone who is being remembered here as part of this procession up to the altar. And you might think of the altar as higher in elevation than that which is outside of it. This is very often literally true in our church buildings, but the whole liturgy can be seen as a journey up a mountain, a heavenly ascent. You see in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man, who is a high priestly figure ascending on the clouds of heaven to the throne of God. And the throne of God in the scriptures is linked with his altars, with the Ark of the Covenant. And so in the divine liturgy, what happens? Well, the priest ascends to the altar while swinging, while a censer is being swung behind him, creating an incense cloud. So on the clouds of heaven, in Christ, Christ's representative in the ministry ascends with those whom he remembers following uh, behind in a mystical sense. And this is the reason that the clouds of heaven are mentioned in Daniel 7, because this is a reference of the Day of Atonement, where the high priest descends up to the Holy of Holies. Inwards is upward. The horizontal motion is symbolically correspondent to vertical motion. Uh, he ascends to the Holy of Holies with a censer, creating a great cloud of incense behind him. After the great entrance, we have the consecration of the gifts, and the third and most important part of the liturgy is the communion of the faithful. This is the climactic act of the liturgy because it is the moment where heaven and earth are most intimately tied together. The priest comes out, he descends towards us, and then we go forward. We ascend towards him. It is as if Christ descends to mid-heaven and we ascend up to meet him, which you might notice is precisely the language that is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The relationship of that text and the day of the Lord to the liturgical tradition is a very complicated but very fascinating subject in its own right. I just want to uh, point out to you that symbolically, when you understand the liturgy and the visual imagery of scripture, the descent of the priest, the moving outward of the priest, and then the ascent of us, the moving inwards of the faithful to meet Christ in the Eucharist, well, this anticipates the day of the Lord where we meet Christ as he descends through the clouds. Remember, Christ ascends in the cloud. This is a cloud hidden from their face, and then he descends in the clouds. The day of the Lord is a reality which is increased through history until the resurrection of the dead, where his light irradiates all things. So uh, St. John in the Apocalypse says, I was in the spirit on the day of the Lord or on the Lord's day. This is a reference to Sunday. The divine or the um, uh, Apocalypse of John clearly occurs in a liturgical context. We will talk about that some other time, uh, but there's all sorts of absolutely remarkable and fascinating details that we, we could go into if I didn't want to keep this to just one video. So that is the tripartite structure of the divine liturgy. Let's talk about these biblical passages and why I've selected these specific biblical passages. We begin in Genesis 
Chapter 1, verse 28, and God blessed them, that is, man, whom he has created in his image to be glorified into his likeness. This is the place in the creation week where God says, let us, he addresses the Father, or he addresses the Son and the Spirit. On the uh, first creation day, the Spirit hovers over the water. He descends in a cloud of glory, and inside that cloud of glory we see throughout the scriptures is the angel of the Lord enthroned in the center. Ezekiel 1 says that the cloud of glory is a chariot, and on the chariot is one who is in the likeness of a man. You enter into that cloud and you see God's throne because you're entering into heaven. And surrounding God's throne are myriads and myriads of angels, some of whom are themselves uh, enthroned archons. Uh, in the New Testament, we are seated in heaven with Christ. But my point is that the language of let us, while it is divine counsel language, is rooted ultimately in the Trinity. We see throughout the book of Genesis, God frequently addresses himself. God says, in his heart, or he said, to himself. So the foundation of the heavenly council, which we call the communion of saints, the foundation of the heavenly council is itself the Trinity. And why is this called to attention in the creation of man? Because man, like God, is a plural unity. God is one and three. His Unity is perfected in his uh, uh, threeness, and his threeness is perfected in his unity. He is one God, three divine persons. Well, man is a single organism with a single nature, and yet is a plenitude of persons. And we see one aspect of that plenitude here in the creation of man, where God makes man male and female. And that unity in diversity enables man and also, to some degree, the animals whose natures are present inside of man, which is why we are able to um, have dominion over them, it, that unity and diversity enables man to participate in one of God's capacities or powers. And that is to be, uh, not only have life, but extend life, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now this word subdue is the same word which in the book of Joshua is used to refer to the conquest. We've talked before about how weapons of warfare and tools of creativity are correspondent to each other. In the Messianic age, Isaiah 2 and Micah tells us uh, the uh, swords and spears are not destroyed, but they are turned into tools agricultural tools, moreover, which has special relevance to the Eucharist, they are turned into plows and pruning hooks. And this is the way that God always intended us to have dominion over the creation, not by conquering it violently with bloodshed, but by learning it through wisdom, which subsists in the mind of God and having learned wisdom, one applies that wisdom in creativity. One extends one's mind, fashioned after the image of God in Christ, and glorifies the creation. One draws the creation more and more intimately into the mind and presence of God, and thus brings it from goodness to perfection. That is what it originally means to conquer or subdue the world without bloodshed, without violence. We notice, interestingly, in the visions of Zechariah, as well as other texts, that the notion of consecrating the world, that is, filling it more and more profoundly with the presence of God, the notion of consecrating the world, corresponds symbolically with the notion of conquering the world. Four horsemen go out to the ends of the earth, and they put God's spirit at rest in the north country. That's where Babylon is, or Babel is. And to put his spirit at rest, well, that looks back to texts in the book of Joshua, which speak of the, uh, and the book of Judges, which speak of the land resting after Israel acquires peace through conquest. We see in the book of Revelation that Christ conquers the world with a sword that proceeds from his mouth. Indeed, the sword, as well as fire, is an implement, an instrument of sacrificial worship, as well as 
conquest in warfare. And so we recognize that the four chariots which go out to the ends of the earth in the visions of Zechariah, prophesying the Messianic Age, is a way of looking at the river of life which wells up at the top of Eden and flows out in four rivers to the ends of the earth, consecrating it, sanctifying it. Zechariah 14 says that in the Messianic Age, even the bells of the horses, the most common object used in daily life, in ritual terms, the most profane object, which doesn't mean evil, it just means it, it's common. It's not something which is used in the sanctuary. But God's presence fills everything so that even this most common, normal, daily object is engraved with the words, holy to the Lord. And those words were the very words engraved on the crown of the high priest. The holiest object of clothing in the whole liturgical system in other words, through God's conquest of the world in the gospel, by his divine presence as it flows to the ends of the earth, through the spirit represented in these waters, all things will be filled to the maximal degree with the divine presence. So I say that to explain the way in which there was still something for man to do. God gave man a world which was an infant world. It was a kind of baby universe. But man was to be God's arm in molding and shaping and glorifying it and perfecting it and bringing it from glory to glory, from goodness uh, to perfection. We've talked about that in my videos on glorification uh, and redemption. But how? How is man to do that? And why is it man who does this? Genesis 2.4 will give you the answer to this. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth, says the scripture. This is an interesting turn of phrase because nine other times in the book of Genesis, we see the phrase, these are the generations of. And every single time it is used, it refers to offspring. These are the generations of Adam, Genesis 5 verses 1 to 2. That means that these are Adam's children, his descendants, the generations, that is, those whom Adam generates. We speak of the eternal generation of the Son, which means he is the only begotten of the Father from eternity. God in himself is Father, and to be Father means he is the Father of the only begotten Son, whom he loves in and through the Holy Spirit. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. So if we read it consistently as we ought, this means these are the, this is the record of the offspring of the heavens and the earth. Well, what does that mean? Well, heaven, this is what is created on the first creation day. God makes the heavens and the earth. That is, he creates this environment in which his presence fills all things and around which uh, are myriads and myriads of angelic beings in other texts which recapitulate and follow the structure of the creation week. Psalm 104, for example, we understand that these heavens which are created in the first creation day are not the visible skies which we see, it is rather the environment in which there are all of these angels. Uh, these are the sons of God who shout for joy when God lays the foundation of the earth. That is something which happens uh, uh, after this moment, God creates the heavens and the earth. And the earth is meant to be molded and shaped to grow up into the perfection of its heavenly archetype, where God already fills the whole environment. We saw that this was to happen through man, as man brings things from goodness to perfection more and more intimately into the mind and presence of God. And Genesis 2.4 tells us how. Because it is man who is the offspring of heaven and earth. Man is a microcosm of the world, a miniature representation of the whole structure of creation. Man has both body as well as spirit. Man sums up all of the diverse qualities which are woven into the creation in the wisdom, providence, and beauty of God. And it is because man is the offspring of heavens and earth that man draws them more intimately together. So the heavenly aspect of man is explained in terms of the breath or spirit of life. 
God breathes into man the breath, the spirit of life, and he becomes a living soul. But what does God breathe into? It's the dust of the ground, the adama, the ground. And you can even hear in the word itself, that's feminine. We speak of Mother Earth. That's not wrong to speak of Earth in feminine terms. Remember, feminine is not female. Femaleness is a particular embodied realization of the masculine-feminine dynamic. Just as maleness is a particular kind of masculinity, but masculinity and femininity uh, are a, a pair which extends far beyond just the embodied forms, which is why there are languages everywhere which have masculine and feminine gender. Gender is not the same thing as sex in the traditional definition of the word. And um, I don't care if you use the uh, word gender to refer to sex just in common parlance, but for our purposes, I want to distinguish them for the sake of precision. Please don't don't start a tangent about about that. Um, I, I know it's one of those subjects which could start an endless tangent, and I hold the traditional view on this, so nobody needs to worry about uh, about that. Um, but I just want to uh, keep everyone's mind on the main subject of the video. Um, you can see another example of what I'm talking about, and you can thereby be confirmed in this understanding of Genesis uh, 2-4, in case you think I'm overreading it, in Genesis 4-1. What does Eve say? Eve says, I have gotten or begotten a man with the Lord. Well, a lot of translations render this as with the help of the Lord, and I guess that's a fine interpretation of the text, but there's a reason that the scriptures are phrased the way that they are phrased. Specifically, it says, I have gotten a man with the Lord. In other words, the Lord is the father of the child. It is the Lord who opens the womb and creates life. That's a major theme throughout Genesis. Think of how many barren women there are, and think of the implications of this. If it is true that the ground, the land, corresponds to the human female in the symbolism of creation and the symbolism of Genesis. Then suddenly you can see the significance of all the famines throughout Genesis. The land does not produce fruit and neither do the females. When God opens the womb of Sarah and when he opens the womb of the patriarch's wives, that signifies his transfiguration of the creation from that which is barren descending into death into that which is infinitely fruitful and suffused with the life of God. Because it was the life of God to begin with that turned nothingness into the splendor of creation. So these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. It's the offspring of heaven and earth. It's that which is both earthly and heavenly. It is the human family. And it is in the human family that heaven and earth become more and more perfectly and intimately acquainted with each other. We can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, where Paul calls Jesus the man of heaven. Jesus is the person in whom heaven and earth are perfect perfectly interior to each other. Jesus says of his people, may they be one as you and I are one, speaking to God the Father. The unity of the Father and the Son that is expressed and realized in his operations, in his energies, are, is a unity of mutual interiority. One is in the other. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And Jesus says that they will be in you, speaking to the disciples through the Spirit. Throughout the Gospel of John, there is a major theme of dwelling, of homes. In my Father's house, there are many dwellings. The Father and the Son, Jesus says, make their dwelling in the people of God. In John chapter 1, what's the question that uh, Peter and the beloved disciple, I believe, uh, ask of Jesus? Where are you? dwelling rabbi and where is the beloved disciple to take our lady the mother of god he took her to his own home his own dwelling place i hope you can begin to see the incredible symbolic um, richness of the gospel of john just a taste of uh, of that 
We also see in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, what does it say? The book of the generations of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But that's interesting because generations refers to the offspring of the person at the head of the genealogy. And yet Matthew 1 ends with Jesus as the seed of this genealogy. Did Matthew just read scripture sloppily? No. It is only his interpreters who are at risk of being sloppy. Because Isaiah speaks of the messianic king as both the root and the shoot of David. He's the root of Jesse. He's the branch of David. Likewise for Jesus. It is Jesus who gave existence to the first members of this genealogy. And it is that very same Jesus who is the offspring of that genealogy. So these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, the offspring of the heavens and the earth, the one in whom heaven and earth will be bound together. We mentioned how man perfects the creation by tool making, by creativity, by shaping the world and increasing its likeness to God, by giving it more and more structure and particularity. One starts out, let's say, with just raw silicon. It's not worth very much. But you put spe specific structure into it and shape it after the archetype that you have in your mind. And its value dramatically increases. We see thus in the temple, the inner sanctuary, where God's presence directly dwells, has the most valuable metals. That is why Paul speaks of God's glory as the riches of his glory. Jesus says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. The language of wealth is the language of divine immortality and divine glory, divine richness. And it is language which accentuates the fact that we are to value God above everything else. But here's the thing, in valuing God above everything else, we get everything else thrown in. God is of infinite worth, and infinite worth can purchase everything. But if you have, if you try to have anything without God, you will not get God, nor that which you are trying to get. So agricultural tools are the specific kind of tool which the prophets speak of. Swords and spears are plowshares and pruning hooks. Look at Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis 2 and 3, God is the father of Adam. He's the one who gives Adam existence and birth. Indeed, Luke, reading that, understands it and calls Adam the son of God. Well, in Genesis 9, we have hint a hint of uh, Adam's exalted destiny had he but obeyed, because Noah again and again obeys God to the letter. It says uh, repeatedly, and Noah did exactly as the Lord God commanded him. And then in Genesis chapter 9, Noah has been exalted. As God issues curses in Genesis 3, it is Noah who issues blessings and curses in Genesis 9. As Adam rebelled against God, Ham rebels against Noah. And as God planted a garden, Noah plants a vineyard in Genesis chapter 9. We see thus that the development of the creation, which comes as part of the package of human exaltation. See this blessing to Deuteronomy. God blesses man, makes man fruitful, so also does the land become fruitful. It comes as a package deal. This glorification and development of the world is signified in the language of biblical symbolism in the development of a fruitful ground, a harvest of bread and wine. It is in the Eucharist that all of our work is placed before God. Think about when we put the tithe on God's altar. This is one of those unwritten traditions. It's not in the liturgical book, but it is a tradition. I don't know when exactly it started. I suspect it started very long ago, but as I said, I think that these things are inspired by God. Where do we put the tithe? 
up on the Eucharistic table, it is after the Eucharist is consecrated. In other words, Christ's work is totally sufficient, and our work is perfected when it is joined to his work. We take the tithe, we place it on the altar, and thus join it to the Eucharist. And as it is in the Eucharist, where God dwells not only with man, but in man, not only uh, uh, with the creation, but in and through the creation, bread and wine become body uh, and blood of Christ. That is when heaven and earth are bound together into a single organism. And it is not something which exists only in its own context, but it is the lens through which we see everything in the creation. This is the summit of the entire created order, the Eucharistic uh, liturgy. And how do we understand that in terms of scripture? Well, let's read Genesis 2 verse 5. When no shrub of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, just notice here, it does not say didn't exist, but that it hadn't sprung up. It's an important distinction. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. So here is the first famine, quote unquote. We use the word famine to refer to land which ought to be fruitful, but isn't yet. But just as darkness can signify evil, but begins simply as created infancy, so also for land which has not yet uh, borne fruit. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the water. And God, through the six-day creation, he molded and shaped it and brought it up and increased its likeness to its heavenly archetype. And then man is created as the image of God. In other words, man is going to continue those things that God was doing throughout the sixth creation day. So we see Adam naming animals as his first major act in Genesis 2, just as God named creatures in Genesis chapter 1. But we see here, God calls, or Moses and God through him calls attention to a land which had not yet borne fruit. And there are two specific categories of plant life which are noted. First, the shrub of the field, and then the small plant of the field. And it is there are two characteristics which explain the situation. No rain, that is no water, and no man. The shrub, this verse is matched with and in a way answered by what is spoken in the curses at the end of Genesis 3. Now let us recall that in the corresponding passage in Genesis 9, there are blessings as well as curses. So in an alternate universe where Adam obeyed, and I don't mean alternate universe literally, I hope that's obvious, but sometimes uh, things I think are obvious aren't, aren't obvious. I'm just speaking of a, an alternative uh, way that this could have gone. In this alternate universe where Adam and Eve were obedient, they were still spiritual infants, but their obedience would train them to become more like God. It would grow them up. That's part of the process of spiritually uh, growing up. Uh, so they would have received blessings at the end of Genesis 3 instead of curses. As C.S. Lewis says, an egg it must either hatch or go bad, but it's never going to stay an egg. The creation must develop, but it can develop into goodness or can develop into evil. So how is this passage answered in Genesis 3? Well, the shrub, that is answered by thorns and thistles. There was no shrubbery yet. Remember, the third creation day refers to Fruit trees and grain plants. Those are the specific plants which are identified. Just read the read, read the text if you don't believe me. Um, this is not a, a, a contradictory text or a second creation story or any such such, such thing. Um, so the shrubbery that comes after the fall is thorns and thistles. And no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. That is, the grains had not yet sprouted ears. Well, 
Look at the curses in Genesis 3. What does the text say? It says, by the sweat of your nose, that is the literal language that is used, sweat of your nose, by the sweat of your nose, you shall eat bread. So we have bread here corresponding to the grain plants, which had not sprouted ears. And it is by what? The sweat of your nose. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. Water signifies that life-creating power of God, which gives birth and renewal to his world. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is not a land as you knew in Egypt, where it is watered by the Nile, but rain from heaven causes it to bring forth fruit. Isaiah speaks similarly, just as the rain falls from heaven, so my word will not return void, but which will, but will do that which I purpose for it. Man was meant to be the instrument of God's increasing the creation in life. What does the psalmist say? By the spirit, you renew the face of the ground. Well, what had God put in man's nostrils? The spirit. It was the breath of life which was in man's nostrils. That is how the rain from heaven was meant to water the ground. We see at the very top of Mount Eden, because this is a holy mountain, there's a river flowing downwards in Ezekiel 28, it's called a mountain. We see at the very top, there is a spring, and that spring in the tripartite structure of the holy mountain is corresponding to the holy of holies. And just think visually for a moment. Think about how the tops of mountains are above the clouds. So what, when we think visually, do we get? Well, this sacred water, this life-giving spring, was meant to be sprinkled on the creation through man, because man had the Holy Spirit in his heart and in his nose. But because of the rebellion of man, it was by hard, back-breaking labor that he would bring forth his food. By the sweat of your nose, you shall bring forth bread. The bread corresponding to the small plants, which had not yet sprung up. Man was meant to glorify the world, but now it is back-breaking labor. Uh, and there was no man to work the ground. Well, man works the ground either way, but in uh, at the beginning, it was meant to be a purely joyous, pleasurable, splendid experience by which he brought creation from glory to glory. And then it is back-breaking labor by which uh, he does this. Now, here's a significant point for today's purposes. Genesis 2.5 comes after Genesis 2.4. Now, I know that's obvious, but because we've spent so much time individually discussing the verses, I want to call your attention to it. Man is the generations of the heavens and the earth. He is the meeting place of heaven and earth, just like the temple is. Man is a living temple. The temple has the glory cloud of God inside it. Man is the spirit inside of him. The idea of man as a temple is not just a New Testament idea. Man is the meeting place of heaven and earth. And as man grows, so heaven and earth will grow more intimately acquainted. You want to see a concrete example of how this works in the analogy of human life? Think about bones. When Adam says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, it's literally self of myself, flesh of my flesh. Blood is that in which there is life, whereas blood produced is produced from the bones. We talked about this in a video on the, on the theology and the symbolism of blood in scripture and in reality, because scripture describes an exegete's reality for us. As a person develops, as any organism develops, it both becomes more and more distinct and becomes more and more united, both within itself and in relation to the whole human family and the whole creation. So think in terms of bones. When a child is born, he has more bones than he does when he reaches maturity. And the child is growing more and more united as he grows up. Likewise for the creation. The creation grows more and more united as it develops. And the focal point and instrument of that development is man himself. Because man is the meeting place of heaven and earth and following the logic we just talked about here, that means that man will 
unite heaven and earth in a closer and closer relationship, thus bringing heaven and earth together in a closer and closer relationship more broadly. So Genesis 2.5 explains how that happens. Man is called to guard and cultivate the garden. When God creates man, he said, I believe it's Genesis 2.15, guard and cultivate it. That is, preserve what's good, that's the priestly role, and make it better, perfect it. Not that there was evil, but that it was an envy. It was meant to develop. Um, preserve what is good, that's the priestly, and creatively glorify it. Make it even more splendid. That's the kingly role. Kings both conquer, and remember we've seen in this video how conquest corresponds symbolically with creative development, with technology and such. Uh, kings are associated with conquest, they're associated with cities. Look at Genesis 4, when Cain builds his city, we get a history of the development of early human technology, including, for example, musical instruments. Uh, but Genesis 2.5 explains the way in which heaven and earth grow closer and closer together. And when we see the way that Genesis 2.5 corresponds with Genesis 3, we recognize just how relevant the Eucharist is. Because we've seen that the notion of human work to harvest bread, well, that is a way of speaking of the whole range of human activity in creation. Here's why I say that. We see not only the raw material for food in Genesis 2, but we also see the raw material for metallurgy and for cutting precious stones, because we're told of Eden, which has food, and Havilah, which has gold, and which has bedellium. It has these precious materials. Well, in Genesis 4, we have uh, in the dynasty of Cain, we have a figure called Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain is one of three brothers Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Now, Jubal is the father of those who make instruments. This is something new, significant to that. I don't want to get into it right now. But Jabal is clearly a figure who corresponds to Abel. Abel was a keeper of livestock. And Cain was one who brought food from the ground. Well, Tubal Cain, you can obviously tell it corresponds to Cain. Tubal Cain, how does he correspond to Cain? He uh, is uh, the forger of instruments of bronze and iron. He also harvests stuff from the ground, except it's metal instead of food. So we see that these two things symbolically correspond to each other. And essentially, this is a way of telling us that when we read about agriculture, when we read about what man was supposed to do with food, turning it into bread, um, this is a way of articulating and interpreting the significance of all human creativity, or to say, all human work. What is the kind of work that God rests from on the seventh day? It is his creativity. And man in resting on the seventh day rests from that very same kind of work creative work so it is in the eucharist that all of this is fulfilled and summed up christ joins heaven and earth together paul says it was god's intent to unite all things in him this is ephesians chapter one Things in heaven and things on earth. The whole range of creatures, the whole fabric of reality is present in the person of Jesus Christ. And yet, we are not in the world to come. The world to come, after a fashion, is in us, but the whole world has not been made the world to come. Why? Because it belongs to this age to implement the work of Christ through the church. The book of Acts says that in my last book, Luke is speaking here, I spoke of what Jesus began to do and to teach. By implication, the book of Acts is Jesus' continuing ministry. Jesus has, in this sense, one single coming. Jesus becomes incarnate. He does the work in the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and he is still present 
as heavenly high priest, he has sent down his spirit. Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth, would that it were already kindled. He sent down his spirit and he continues that work through the church. Just as God was to perfect the creation, to glorify the creation through man as his arm, so also does Christ do his work in the world through the organism which uh, is the church. And the church is the fulfillment of the human destiny. God doesn't throw away the original plan. He accomplishes that original plan. So in the very same movement, the very same act that he redeems and saves the world, he also accomplishes its original purpose, glorification of the world. See my video series on glorification and redemption if you want more discussion on that. The Eucharist is bread and it is wine. The Eucharist is the body and the blood of Christ. Christ has redeemed all things by taking body and soul of man into himself. Man is a miniature representation of creation. Thus, Christ, in taking man into himself, takes the whole world into himself. And it is not just that man is taken into Christ, but that Christ gives himself to man thereby. Heaven and earth have been united in him, so heaven and earth are united in the church. The church is what? The body of Christ. The Eucharist is what? The body of Christ. You are what you eat. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, says the Apostle Paul. Well, life of the flesh is in the blood. Partake of the body and the blood of Christ. Is this not the koinonia, the communion of the body and the blood of Christ, says Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this explains why all of our work is joined to Christ's work in the Holy Eucharist. Because when we do whatever our job is, in fact, what I'm doing right now, however well I happen to be doing it, is part of this creative task. And our tithe is our consecration of that work to God. And we recognize that the raw materials on which we work and the power through which we work is given us as a gift of God, which is why it's called Eucharist, Thanksgiving. And it is in that Eucharist, which is both the end of the last week, the eighth day, and the beginning of the next week, the first day, it is in the Eucharist that we consecrate the work of the last week to God and begin the work of the next week. And that is why it is bread and wine. It's not as if God could have just used Cheetos and orange soda. It is bread and wine for a reason. Bread is protological, wine is eschatological. That's why at the end of the Garden of Eden narrative, it speaks of bread, but Noah, he doesn't plant a field, that's not what's called attention to, he plants a vineyard and he draws wine from it. When it says Noah became drunk, that word does not need, it can imply it, but it doesn't in the meaning of the word itself, imply he did anything sinful. No, he drank wine and he rested, just as God rested. He, Noah rested in his tent, just like the dwelling place of God is signified in something like the tent of meeting. So God rests in his creation. Noah rested in his tent. And just as Adam rebelled against God, so also Ham rebelled against Noah, as we spoke of before. And that is why we have leavened bread, a loaf, and not a... Uh, uh, unleavened bread in the Eucharist. In the Passover, this was a new birth for Israel, but they were spiritual children, as Paul says in Galatians. How is it that bread rises? Well, it's through heat. It's through fire. Fire is glory. Fire is eschatological. And thus, in the resurrection of Jesus, we have human nature which is glorified which is perfected which is jesus is the first spiritual grown-up in human history as james jordan so memorably puts it so we use leavened bread and why is it wine well what does wine feel like at the back of your throat heat wine feels like heat when you drink wine what happens you get more talkative you become more social well remember what we said earlier as man matures he both becomes more distinct personally, but also more integrated. He grows closer together with other human persons as he becomes more distinctly himself, because the more distinctly yourself you are, the more that you have to give. 
And the most obvious aspect is that you produce wine by fermenting grapes. The grapes have to mature, develop towards glory. So man is the one who is of heaven and earth, in whom heaven and earth are united. Christ is the true and perfect man because he is the incarnate word. And in him, Paul says, all things in heaven and earth have been stitched together. That is implemented through the church, which is his body. The church becomes present through the Holy Eucharist, and we join our work to the Holy Eucharist, thereby filling all of our work with heavenly life. And thus, because our work changes the world, we are heavenizing the world. So let's end with our discussion of Leviticus 1 to 3. And this will be shorter, relatively speaking. Leviticus 1 to 3 is a single divine speech. This is something you have to pay attention to. Okay, there are three chapters, but it's one divine speech. In other words, it says, the Lord said to Moses only once in the, all of these three chapters. What this means is that these three distinct offerings are part of a single symbolic narrative. Now, the traditional translations for these offerings are not good translations because they often describe what uh, is, the offering is made up of, but the actual word itself is left untranslated. Um, Ola is often translated whole burnt offering. Why? Well, because the offering is all burned up. But the word actually means ascension, as uh, G.K. Wenham points out in his commentary on Leviticus. Hardly the only one who notices. Uh, Mincha in Leviticus chapter 2 is often rendered grain offering because it is made up and part of grain. But it's actually tribute. It's when a king conquers a region, the subject client kingdom gives that king a tithe from their economic increase. And that's a tribute. Well, God is king of kings. We give him a tribute as thanksgiving, as Eucharist, because he gave us everything which we're working with to begin with, so we give a tribute. And remember, Leviticus chapter 2, the minka, the tribute offering, that is what Malachi says the nations will offer to God from the rising of the sun. And it is called the offering of remembrance. Jesus says, do this as my memorial. It's a tribute offering, which Jesus specifically identifies as uh, the most relevant image for the Eucharist. And then we have there the peace offering. Uh, this, when you see the word sacrifice in English Bibles, that often, or that almost always refers to the peace offering. Moses says uh, to Pharaoh, uh, God wants his people to go three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to him. That is to have a peace meal with him. This is a sacrificial meal. This is the one offering in the scriptures that uh, the uh, uh, people, in part, share with their God. You are what you eat, so when you eat the same things, you become interior to one another. That's why marriages are signified and expressed with feasts. Remember the Eucharist is the marriage supper of the Lamb? Because being married is to be interior to one another, to be one flesh. And um, it is not merely the joining of two individuals, but their respective families are joined together. This is something that uh, perhaps is a little more difficult to understand today when um, there's so little emphasis on the extended family. But traditionally, the extended family is knit together through the individual persons who are married. And so the families of both spouses come to feast and they eat of the same food, and thus they become interior to one another. These two family lines and their, des their destinies are woven uh, together. And that is what happens in the sacrificial meal called the peace offering. So what's the narrative here? Well, the narrative is simply one of the divine liturgy. Remember what we talked about at the beginning, and it's up here on the slide. The little entrance. That is where the priest in antiquity would first approach the altar. If the divine liturgy is an ascent up into the heavens, we step forward and approach the mountain in the little entrance. This is why the reading of the gospel and then the sermon follows the little entrance in the order of liturgical 
worship. Israel approaches Mount Sinai, a journey out of Egypt. Spiritually speaking, Egypt is uh, the place from which we're coming. And remember, Egypt is meant to be redeemed, not thrown away. That's a topic for another day. But we, Israel comes out of Egypt. They approach the holy mountain, altars and miniature holy mountains. Ezekiel even calls uh, his altar the mountain. They gather around that mountain, and then God descends and speaks. And then Moses speaks on his behalf, Exodus 21 to 23. Moses speaks just as ex Exodus 20, God speaks directly. So God speaks to us after we approach the altar in the little entrance. God speaks to us in the gospel and the epistle. And then our Moses is the person who's celebrating the liturgy, who gives us a sermon chews up the word of God, the scroll, and then meditates it on it, boils it into wisdom, ideally, and helps the church digest it themselves. Then you have the great entrance. The great entrance, to the little entrance is ascension. You ascend to the mountain. The great entrance, this is the tribute. Because it is the tribute where we take of our work and in the form of bread and of wine, we consecrate it to God. We place it on his altar. We bring it to his mountain. And in the great entrance, we remember those who are written in the diptychs and we remember indeed the whole world. Just as Israel brings a mixed multitude with them to the holy mountain remembering all of us in his kingdom says the celebrant of the liturgy so in the great entrance we have the tribute the tribute is called the offering of remembrance and after israel comes into the promised land they put not only bread but also wine on the altar now what is really important for our purposes is to understand that according to the scriptures in the old covenant the wine had to be poured out the priest would eat of the holy bread, but the wine had to be poured out. He could not drink of the wine because Israel was protological, not eschatological. Israel was a spiritual child. The church in Christ is glorified. And that is why we drink of both elements. And that's why it's so important that we partake of both the bread and, um, and the wine, the body uh, and the blood. That's the great entrance. And the communion of the faithful, that is the piecemeal. Because the piecemeal is the participation in that sacrificial animal which has been consecrated to God by God and man eating together of the same food and thus becoming interior to one another. The imagery in scripture on this is, is quite concrete. Jesus says, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Jesus says in the book of Revelation that if you are neither hot nor cold, he will spit you out of his mouth. Well, you must be inside of him. You must be inside his mouth in order for that to happen. In other words, you become interior to one another. Christ and the church are interior to one another. They are bridegroom and bride. They are... Uh, there is a mutual indwelling that mirrors the mutual indwelling of the Holy Trinity, Father and Son, Son and Father, Spirit and Father uh, and Son, and then the Spirit in us draws Father and Son into us, and this is preeminently signified and realized in the Holy Eucharist as the climactic moment of the divine liturgy. So that is the theology of the divine liturgy writ large. And I want to wrap up by explaining something really just that was so striking to me because I think it showed the divine inspiration of the tradition. When I really started to understand the Bible, it was actually after I had been tonsured uh, and ordained a reader. Um, and in the service for ordaining a reader, there's a promise that the Spirit will be with you in uh, order to help interpret Scripture. I only realized this connection years later. It was after this that I encountered James Jordan, Peter Lighthart, started to realize how to interpret Scripture typologically, symbolically, in a Christ-centered and Christ-oriented way. And it was such an enriching, faith-building experience. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And 
for the first time in many ways, I was really hearing the word of Christ. Um, but after I began to really assimilate biblical symbolism into my mind, the most curious thing happened. I began to understand the divine liturgy. I hadn't read any books on understanding the divine liturgy, but things began to simply make sense. It was as if the symbolic universe of the Bible and the symbolic universe of the liturgy was one and the same. And later I read St. Germanus of Constantinople's commentary on the divine liturgy. And it turned out that the interpretations that came to me through understanding scripture were the interpretations of the church of St. Germanus. Well, how, how did I know that? It was because I learned it from scripture. And that shows the profound and rich way in which the Bible lives in the Orthodox Church. The Bible declares the mind of Christ, and we have the mind of Christ. The Bible is that by which Christ causes himself to be remembered in us. And Christ is remembered in his most perfect sense in the tradition of the Orthodox Christian Church. As you all know, I mean, I, I, uh, other Christians, they truly have, in many cases, tasted the goodness of Jesus. But all of these gifts are set forth in their splendor in the Orthodox Church. So uh, I want to thank you for listening. Um, I hope you got something out of today's video. Um, and I will, by God's will, see you soon. Please keep me in your prayers. And later, skater. <laughs>